Welcome everyone um, to our third and final Game Changer uh, seminar for 2023 today. And we're really pleased to see so many of you here and also those people online. <clears throat> On behalf of TRI, I better just use these slides. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are on today and to recognize their continuing connection with land, water and community. We, we pay our deep respect to them and their cultures and their elders past and present. It's a real pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Professor Rochelle Buckbinder AO uh, to TRI today. So thank you for traveling to Brisbane. And I think it's not the first time you've been in this auditorium in the past week. So it's great to have you here. Um, Rochelle um, combines rheumatology clinical practice with research. She holds an NH and MRC investigator fellowship and is professor and head of the musculoskeletal health and wiser health care units in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine Monash University. Rochelle is known internationally as a vocal proponent of evidence-based medicine. And her landmark studies, which I presume we'll hear something about uh, during her talk, particularly those examining treatments accepted into clinical practice before their adequate evalu evaluation. Rochelle's book, Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath, written with Professor Ian Harris, who's an orthopedic surgeon based in Sydney, was published at the end of 2021. It was written for both the general public and clinicians and highlights society's over-reliance on medicines. If you haven't read it, add it to your reading list because it's well worth the time taken to devour. Rochelle's current broad program of work funded from various NH and MRC schemes includes a program grant, partnership center, a CRE and project grants. Um, and she is human. Um, they include works are reducing inappropriate overdiagnosis and overtesting across musculoskeletal conditions, reducing healthcare system waste, and identifying more efficient alternate service delivery models, understanding the environmental impact of musculoskeletal healthcare. And this is just to name a few. Please give Rochelle a warm welcome. Uh, so thank you so much, Scott, um, for inviting me here to this lovely um, state. I've had a lovely uh, week here. Um, I hope I don't bore you. I'm going to talk about mainly about my career with a few different highlights. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the custodians of the land in which we meet and also the custodians uh, where I work at Monash University. Um, so I thought I'd give you a timeline. Uh, I studied uh, medicine at Monash, um, completing that in 1981, uh, and I did my undergraduate training at Prince Henry's Hospital, which is no longer, uh, and residency training at the Alfred uh, and rheumatology training at the Alfred and Prince Henry's. Uh, and then we went to uh, Toronto uh, and um, my husband wanted to work in the lab wanted to go overseas. Uh, and then when we came back, I started in private practice. Um, but because I did the master's, I wanted to do research as well. So I had a point one appointment at the university for many years uh, and did lots of teaching of clinical epidemiology uh, and measurement and systematic reviews. Uh, and I uh, didn't really know how to apply for NHMRC, so I didn't really apply for my first grant till 2002. Uh, and, at, and I was appointed the founding director of the Department of Clean Epi at Cabrini Health, which is a not-for-profit private hospital. Uh, and that's where I also work as a clinician. Uh, and we parted ways last year with, uh, for reasons I won't go into, but they weren't nice. Um, so I married uh, a man I met in first year med who used to drive me to uni because I wasn't old enough to drive. Uh, and uh, so that was that occurred while we were residents. Um, 
he's also he's a medical oncologist was head of medical oncology at Peter Mac uh, recently stepped down um, but we're still there um, we had our first child in 1988 in the last year of our training um, both our training uh, and he got his letters and I didn't because my supervisor wrote in the as a PS that I had a baby during the year. My husband's supervisor didn't write that. And so consequently I didn't get my letters uh, and they refused to give them to me till their next meeting, which was in May. And so, and at that time you couldn't part-time or share training. And I used to have to breastfeed at the hospital. And anyway, uh, they eventually gave it to me, but it meant that those six months before we went overseas, I was going to work as a rheumatologist. But I ended up working in general practice. Uh, and I was constantly told I was too slow because I'd been trained as a physician. Uh, so general practice wasn't going to be for me anyway. Um, and then um, I've also been at the School of Public Health um, since we returned from overseas. Um, we had our second baby born in Canada on Canada Day. Uh, so he's a Canadian citizen. Uh, and then we had our last one, uh, 1995. Uh, and... Um, I actually completed a PhD in 2006 uh, and I did it uh, by publication and at that po point in time Monash allowed retrospective PhD so I'd already published papers and I'll show you what I did it on uh, and my boss gave me a week off so I wrote the PhD in a week and my students don't like me to tell them that <laughs> too often. Uh, and when I enrolled for that PhD, I realised uh, that I'd suppressed uh, the memory of starting another PhD um, the year I had the baby, um, and I was meant to give rats adjuvant arthritis, and everyone in the lab knew, but my supervisors had no idea why the rats weren't getting arthritis, and that's because I couldn't bring myself to inject them. Uh, and so by the end of that first year, and I had a, I had a scholarship, I'd even forgotten I had that, um, I realised that um, animal research was not for me. So I was very surprised that I ended up doing a PhD at any time in my career. And then I couldn't, um, I have to talk about my two gorgeous grandchildren <laughs> born uh, four and two years ago. So this is um, basically what I've been doing. So I've been trying to contribute both to better health care and better patient outcomes. So um, I'll talk a little bit about public health, camp, mass, mass media campaign, and then trials that I sort of fell into um, as looking for uh, treatments that are already in standard practice but haven't been properly evaluated, and then optimising the quality of health care and reducing low-value care, uh, and then our book, really, uh, and the wonderful collaborations of partnerships along the way. So this is our time in Canada. Um, these are the two books that I read on the plane home from when we were looking for jobs, and they basically changed the whole course of my career. I thought I was going to be a rheumatologist in private practice, and I actually didn't even want to go overseas. Um, I really didn't want to leave home. Um, and Claire Bombardier is a rheumatologist, epidemiologist, who has really been my lifelong mentor and friend, um, and I did this master's. I was going to do a PhD, um, but I had to convert it to a master's because my husband already had a job at Peter Mac and they wouldn't wait another year. So that was the first, another time I tried to do a PhD. So I just wanted to give you an idea that really epidemiology is a basic science of medicine. I don't think you can be a good clinician unless you understand the basic science of clinical epidemiology. And just to point out the difference between classic epidemiology, which is about population health, and clinical, which was really new. I think I was really the first clin epi person in Melbourne when I came back. It's really about asking clinical questions and improving individual patients rather than the whole population. And over time, I realised that clinicians are, do not have those scientific tools. They still don't understand the difference between personal biases from their experience and evidence uh, and really what it teaches you is to be really sceptical and ask questions. So this, when I first came back, um, people in my department, occupational health doctors, were working with the Victorian Work Cover Authority uh, and the, they wanted to do a mass media campaign for back pain because of a tripling of costs over a decade. 
and um, no one wanted to work with them. They said, oh, I never lead anywhere. Don't do it. And I was, I had nothing to do. So when they asked me, I just said, okay, I'll give it a go. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but I set up the evaluation um, paid for by by the Work Hub Authority. So again, no funding. Uh, and this campaign, I don't know if you're from Victoria, but hopefully you'll recognise these ads, which ran at the end of the 1980s uh, and basically made a dramatic difference to improve attitudes and beliefs of the general public um, about back pain. And it was sustained over at least seven years. Uh, we also demonstrated improvements in clinician behaviour, reduction in work cover claims, the duration, the costs by a very significant amount. Unfortunately, the, the government changed at the end of this time and that no further ads have ever been shown. Um, but this campaign was the first time uh, that this approach had been used for back pain. It won this uh, Volvo Award and I had to go to uh, Edinburgh to get my prize and I lost my luggage. So my first lesson uh, as a researcher, uh, always have a change in your overnight bag. And I turned up to the first day of the meeting in my track suit with these men in suits. Felt very uncomfortable. Um, and eventually behind my back, Monash submitted it. So uh, I won the Moni Molly Holman Award. Molly is a famous female um, chemist at Monash, one of the um, um, women pioneers uh, and also commendation for the Premier's Award, um, which again came as a shock because I didn't know that my department would, had submitted it. It's been replicated now in many other countries. It's still going in Canada. And most recently this year, uh, they did a media campaign in France, all based on the same messages that we did all those years ago. Um, so a little bit about combining clinical practice. Um, it really has helped me to identify important questions based on patients that I see. Uh, and also, you know, research takes a long time to give outcomes, whereas you get this immediate gratification by seeing patients. So I love both of it, both of them together. Uh, it's been, it's hard. If you've got a sick patient, you can't finish the grant. Uh, and then family first and uh, Lucky, my family always said swimming came first for me and then the family. Um, but it requires a lot of determination. I worked, you know, I had three young kids. So I worked a lot at night and weekends. Um, and I also had to overcome, I'm quite shy and uh, I have a giant chip on my shoulder. Uh, and so I had to overcome those things when I talked. To, I mean, talking like this is fine, but yeah. Uh, so I did studies that I could do with minimal or no funding, and I've listed some of those here. Um, and I've developed now quite a few new tools. Um, those are two early ones that I helped other people to develop, um, but I've developed the health literacy questionnaire, which has been cited over a thousand times. I've developed a tool to assess the risk of bias of prevalence studies, which is used in the GBD study, also over a thousand times used a lot for prevalence studies. Um, my first um, systematic review was published with my first PhD student uh, in the BMJ and Cochrane, and they just published it. There was no, thank you very much, we accept your paper, no revisions. <laughs> so that was really the, a very false, in, you know, Sally couldn't believe that there were no corrections, but they just published it. So that was really bizarre. Uh, and, you know, an idea, again, from patients about what's the true risk of uh, cancer in people with inflammatory myopathies. This was the very first population-based study. I worked with Graham Giles at the Cancer Registry and Senior Dennett, uh, who reviewed all um, muscle biopsies over a period of time that had been performed in Victoria. And that was also the first time that there was, a, you know, demonstrated this link. Um, my first trial um, was published in JAMA and it was the first time that I, this this happened, again, no funding, um, but my friend Ronnie Potasnik had become a radiologist and they wanted to bring this machine into Australia and, and charge patients and he asked me to read the stuff from the company and what I thought and I said, well, this is a lot of rubbish, there's no proof that this works and so 
they, to their credit, agreed to do a two trials. Uh, and if we found it was of no benefit, they would stop offering it to patients, which they did. And this was the first time that I really uh, was started, had hate mail, um, because it was published in the US around the same week that the FDA approved this treatment. Uh, so I was harming millions of people who couldn't get this miraculous treatment and, and I was maiming and causing disability. And I was, you know, I was on uh, uh, blogs and people were trying to say my motives were financial and all these things happened. So that was already that 2002. But this is the trial that I'm, um, known for, and this is the first placebo-controlled tr uh, trial of this injection of cement into people's spines for fractures. It had been around for 10 or 15 years. It was in standard practice in the US without a single, not even a controlled trial, not even a randomised trial, and certainly not a placebo-controlled trial. And so we published this in the New England. It took a long time to do. Um, we had trouble recruiting because people were scared. They didn't want to go in the trial because they were scared of the treatment. And a concurrent trial done at the Mayo, they couldn't recruit either because everyone said it was unethical because they just wanted the treatment. Um, and we found that it didn't cause any benefit, and but it had a lot of harms. Uh, it's subsequently been confirmed by four other trials. Um, but there... And and so this is a case that I realised, um, and I've it's been happening more and more in the things that we started to uh, investigate afterwards. This disappearing treatment effect: the higher the quality of the study, um, the smaller the treatment effect. So if you can't demonstrate a benefit from an um, unblinded trial, there's very little chance it's going to be beneficial if you do a placebo trial. And there was lots of good press around the trial. Uh, and, it, and it really was the start of um, being able to do placebo surgical trials. And the only reason we did it was because at, around the time I wanted to do the trial, I was not thinking about a placebo, but the first trial of arthroscopy versus placebo was published. And that's when I thought we can actually really do this. It's, it's not ethical not to do this. And the harassment started even before I published the trial. I was shouted out at meetings. I was set up at meetings. Uh, and then after it was published, I got daily emails. I got harassed. I got physically threatened. Um, and the legal people at Monash had to send letters, restraining orders. Um, and that's really continued. Uh, even uh, I was quoted about a medical cannabis um, article by Lee Mannix a couple of weeks ago and um, saying that our systematic review found that it, it's not effective for chronic pain and I immediately got an email from someone uh, saying I should be ashamed of myself and it's it's a wonderful thing medical cannabis for his pain uh, but he didn't spell his name correctly uh, he said he had no side effects and I wanted to write back saying except for cognitive impairment and my husband wouldn't let me <laughs> he said do not reply <laughs> So anyway, I've had, I'm quite anxious to get panic attacks or, or because of when this all started. And I wasn't the only one harassed. This is Martin van der Weyden who wrote in the MJA um, that he was harassed and told not to publish anything about our trial, that his reputation would be at stake. Uh, and it just went on and on for quite a few years. Uh, and then by 2011, I become quite used to it. This was a systematic a patient, uh, individual patient meta-analysis we published with the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and this was an email I was copied on. Um, and so part of me wants to have some black humor about this um, and to be, you know, being told that um, I'm ashamed of you and I'm a moron. Uh, it does get, get, bit, get on your nerves a bit, um, but I guess they don't like my messages. So I next want to talk about some collaborations. I've been in Cochrane for many years. I've been coordinating, coordinating editor for about 20. Um, we've got a national database for people starting biologic drugs. We set up the clinical trial network for musculoskeletal about eight years ago now. And we've got this wonderful WISER collaboration across Australia, reducing overdiagnosis and overtreatment and the Partnership Centre uh, looking at waste, including research waste. Uh, so this is WISER. Um, it's Bond University, Sydney, Goonie, Wollongong and Monash. Um, amazing 
um, people. We've now got about 150 people all working towards reducing overdiagnosis and overtreatment and low value care. Um, and that's the website if you want to have a look. Um, we've got a national action plan and um, we're now looking at carbon neutral healthcare as well. Uh, this is the clinical trial network that we saw a need for. Um, we developed a mission, vision and values over a, a couple of days with 100 people at the beginning uh, and they are wonderful people shown there who have been uh, along the journey with me. Uh, and this, this comes from our second CRE. So we were lucky enough to get a CRE about six, five years ago. Uh, and we launched the CRA the same day as we published a series of papers in The Lancet that I'll talk about in a second, and we got Greg Hunt to come and launch it. And then we were lucky enough to uh, start a new CRE. Um, and, and so um, what, what we're doing is we're capacity building. Um, we have lots of young people. We've got an early career um, group that is really active, got a meeting next week. They're running their day. Uh, we've got over 400 people now. We've got lots of trials published in, in major journals. We've got some special interest groups, including health economics, osteoarthritis, back pain. Uh, and now we have basic science as well. And so because of, this is the try, um, I thought I'd tell you a bit about the basic science. So this was coming, this comes from our first CRE. The whole ecosystem from the reviews to identifying the important questions to doing the trials to changing, implementing the evidence into practice. And our current one um, includes basic and applied science um, led by Paul Hodges. Uh, and it's trying to marry clinician researchers and basic scientists together to improve the science of basic and applied science, but they can improve uh, and enhance our trials by looking at mechanisms and mediators. So we have this big plan now bringing everybody together uh, and we've got, we have annual meetings and we've got one next week in Sydney um, and the basic scientists are going to present um, their survey about what's needed. Um, we also do living guidelines. So um, this is Sam Whittle, a practitioner fellow, uh, and we've got Australian living guidelines for inflammatory arthritis in adults and children, and we're planning some for shoulders and back pain. This is my wonderful team in uh, Melbourne. Uh, I don't think it's even all of them. I've, we've got about 30, over 30 people now, uh, including some people who live interstate and overseas. Uh, this is just a summary of some of the things that we've uh, evaluated uh, and you can see the biggest list is on the left where we need to stop doing things and most of those have been in practice routinely without proper evidence and when we, when we get the evidence we find they actually don't work and they're harmful. Uh, and that includes things like decompression for shoulder pain, PRP injections, stem cell injections, uh, um, cannabis. Um, there are some things I've done that we have proved that they do work. And, and I always set off looking with an open mind about whether things will work. I thought vertebroplasty worked. I thought we were going to be the first to prove it worked. And I was just a little bit worried about harms. Um, so I'm often wrong. <laughs> and, and then there's the, some of the trials we're currently doing. Um, the other thing I've done is tried to give back. So I was on PBAC Economic Subcommittee for a while. You know, we've done lots of international guidelines. I chaired the back and neck group for the Global Burden of Disease Study. Um, I've been ARA president. Um, I've, I've done committees for the commission and the NPS uh, and uh, currently I, or just finished MSAC uh, and this is the Lancet series, uh, and I just highlight this because, again, I told you I was shy, and, and so what this happened was I saw that there was a physical activity um, series in the Lancet, uh, and so I wrote to uh, Richard Horton, just little old me, saying, would you be interested in doing a back pain series, thinking he wasn't going to reply. He replied the same day and said, I'd love to work with you. I'm in Melbourne next week. Let's meet and talk about it. And so um, we got 31 authors, 12 countries, and we did this amazing series. We actually hired a media company to help us um, to make sure it had impact. Um, and we, we actually published the results of the media impact in The Lancet. 
um, as a result, there have been many good things. So we've got WHO guidelines for back pain coming out in December. Australia now have clinical care standards and there, there's many, many things. Uh, and I'm just about to write to Richard with the second series. So I just want to finish by saying I've had lots of privileges. These are some of the young people that I've mentored in the middle and on the right. Um, the two people sitting either side of me were final year medical students that came to Australia um, from the Netherlands and um, they've now got three babies. They've, they've just had um, twins and they already had a little son and I visited them a couple of months ago. Um, and I've been really fortunate to, uh, I just want to show you a picture of my family. So that's when I uh, got my first, that um, premier, the government house, the um, commendation award with my kids all wearing Danny's suits and shoes, but their own sports socks. Uh, and my mum, who wasn't invited, but rang the governor and got herself invited. She wasn't going to miss out. <laughs> Uh, and in the middle, that's Molly Holman, um, and she's a lovely lady who taught me bike chem at uni, uh, and in the end, I drove her home. <laughs> uh, and then on the right is a Canadian award that I won, and I want to show a picture of Claire Bombardier, who's standing next to me there, um, who's an amazing woman. Uh, but time for fun. I've been to Maccabea uh, twice in Masters Swimming, uh, so uh, and I... Uh, swim a little bit, um, not very good compared to some people in the audience, um, but I love it. And so it's really important for my mental health to start the day with a swim. Um, and I've also received these overwhelming honours. And, and I just want to show you my grown up family there when I got the AO. Um, and my eldest son is now a rheumatologist that works with me, and my youngest son's uh, an intern and wants to do anaesthetics. And my middle son started medicine and hated it. Uh, and he's a, a lawyer. <laughs> uh, and then there's um, Peter Doherty when I won the uh, Royal Society of Victoria Medal at the end of last year. Uh, and uh, this is last week when I won the AHMS Medal. So totally overwhelming and humbling. Uh, and finally, this is the Rockefeller Foundation. Ian and I were lucky enough to, to get a writing fellowship to spend a month to write the book in Bellagio, Italy. And we lived in that um, villa uh, and um, that's a photo of Ian when we arrived. We arrived by ferry and, and everything you can see up, up on that hill is the Bellagio Foundation Gardens um, where we spent a month and were treated like kings and queens. Uh, so that's just the book. Um, it's based on the Hippocratic Oath uh, and if you read the oath, you'll see there's many things that we're doing wrong in medicine that Hippocrates wrote about. Uh, and then we were fortunate last year, we did a 10 day hike in the Dolomites, which I thought I was going to die on one day. Um, but then we made it back to the Rockefeller Foundation and we were able to give them a personal copy of the book in the library. Um, and anyone that's been to the Rockefeller Foundation, they, they put all the things that people worked on since 1958 in this library. And if you get a fantastic idea, apply to the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for a writing fellowship because it's probably one of the highlights of my life. Uh, so thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Rochelle. Um, <clears throat> let me just close out that and be able to see, Alan, if there are any questions online. Um, so that was just an amazing overview. My first, obviously, thought was asking you the question, when do you sleep? But more seriously, how do you, how have you through your career managed family, work, research, clinical practice, media? What about work-life balance, which is something we're talking about more than perhaps we have in the past? Um, so I'm always minded by, a, um, when I sat on a panel for um, senior principal research fellows, when I was like on the panel, and we asked one of the um, applicants um, the same sort of question and he said something like, I live and breathe research, I love it, it's my life. <laughs> and so I guess um, I love it and I love, the, I love seeing patients and I love the combination, I love my kids and family um, and I don't know how we did it. I, I guess I have a very supportive husband who has his own um, fantastic career um, 
and I have my mum who passed away a few years ago, but um, family were very helpful um, when the kids were growing up. Uh, and I just wanted to do it, um, have the buzz, the passion. Um, so I guess that's my answer. And I, you know, I still find time to see my friends, to go out, to swim. Um, so that's why I put the swimming slide in. That, that's what really keeps me sane. Um, and I worked around the kids. So because I worked for myself as a rheumatologist, I only worked, I worked two days a week until about 20 years ago. And now I work one day a week. So I just worked around the kids and just shuffled days um, to be at school. I did canteen and um, I did outings. I did an outing in Canada to the pumpkin patch <laughs> and then realised there were only foreign mothers there and no one ever goes twice because the kids nearly die of um, by, of cold and we all had frostbitten hands. So I need, and no one ever does that more than once, I don't think, in Toronto. But. Thanks, Rochelle. I think the answer to the question was three hours a night. Um, questions? Uh, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. And I, I think um, a lot of things came through for me. One, one of them was um, you were very kind of upfront talking about some of the pushback you'd had um, against people who got very angry about the results of your data. And I guess that raises questions for me around dealing with misinformation, something that became a big issue during the recent pandemic. Um, how have you gone about dealing with that? And I wonder whether, um, have you had any experience dealing with some of the consumer organisations, the patient groups to kind of help you have, have they been allies for you that you've been able to help in terms of uh, correcting some of the misinformation out there in the in the wider world? Okay, that's a really big topic. Um, so what I've tried to do is support others and the more I talk about it, the more I hear stories. Uh, and we've talked about this at NHMRC and lots of people have had pushback. Speak to the person who uh, did the the plain packaging for cigarettes. Uh, they, they took her to court. Uh, she couldn't do research for three years responding. Um, people, people are being, it happens all the time. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of the abuse I've got is from men. Um, you know, I've, I've ha and I guess in the evening, I, I throw my hands up in the morning, I go, I go, it, it, I, and so I think what I do is I dissociate myself a bit. I put patients at the heart of it. So I don't want to harm patients. That's what's my driver. And so that's why we wrote the book. We want patients to be more sceptical, um, to actually know what they're going in for, to ask the right questions about harms. Uh, and some people I won't persuade, um, but I have a lot of support from my colleagues. A lot of people think like we do, and we're trying to set up ways of helping junior researchers to deal with it because it happens to junior researchers. It started when I was, was 20 years ago. I wasn't that old then. Um, so, and it also makes me, I guess, know that I'm hitting a nerve, uh, but it has been traumatic. And, and you know, with veroplasty, it's industry. So the industry are behind it. Uh, and they do things like pay lots of clinicians. Um, they also work with consumer organisations. So I'm a bit, you know, cautious about consumer organisations because they get funding from industry. Um, and with vertoplasty, um, the, uh, American Osteoporosis Day basically were telling people that if you've got a fracture and you don't have uh, vertoplasty, you'll end up with pain for the rest of your life. So they link with consumer. You know, they're much cleverer than us. They have peer opinion leaders that publish in their journals uh, and um, put our replies behind paywalls. There's lots of things like that happening. Uh, they've even tried to change Wikipedia and luckily someone uh, who was uh, the, like the, the protector of the site realised that the, and worked out that the person trying to change it was in the company, was paid for by the company. Um, so they were trying to change the text in Wikipedia even. So I think when you come against industry, and 
you know, I haven't been to court. Some of my friends have. Uh, I think that's even scarier. Um, so I think we, I think we as a researchers have to do something about it. We've got to stand up. Um, we've got plans for other people stepping up, you know, writing to newspapers, making it public. So um, I don't know what the right way forward is. I tried to, I, I had a letter in the, I had an article in the BMJ that I worked on with the editor for a year, but then they ran it past their legal team and they wouldn't let us publish it. They said that um, they were too scared of um, getting sued um, by, you know, it was the people who were, um, what's that word, were doing it to me. They were, they were worried that I was doing it to them. Like it was bizarre. So. Thanks, Rochelle. We've got a question online. Maybe you've um, covered this to an extent, but about the book, um, what's the most important takeaway and what solution do you suggest? <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> yeah, just uh, so in the book, we wanted to focus on what doctors are doing wrong. So we didn't want to focus on industry. There's lots written about that. Um, and and so what we can do as doctors, and I, one of the fundamental things that we think is that this that there's lack of science literacy. And so we want that, you know, that's got to be taught better in medical school and physio school. We've got to have clinicians who understand evidence so they don't put personal biases up and their experience over evidence. So that's one thing. Uh, and then also we work, you know, medicine's a business model. So the business model rewards more, more health care, not improvements in health. It's geared to treatment, not prevention. Um, doctors overestimate the benefits of what we do and we tend to underestimate its harms. Uh, and the last chapter of the book was sort of possible solutions from the point of view of clinicians, patients, regulators, uh, universities, government. Um, I don't think it's a simple answer. And even if health professionals are doing the right thing, it won't work unless we have a whole of system approach. But education is key, um, I think. So could I extend you a little bit? I mean, the, the, the evidence you've provided where there were gaps in evidence has been incredible. But one of the real challenges is changing practice, the implementation steps. How has that worked, particularly in your clinical realm, in terms of convincing surgeons and radiologists and rheumatologists to stop referring so, patients? Uh, well, I think that we're making a difference. I haven't, um, our most recent trial was published in JAMA last year, uh, and we worked with the federal government with the Behavioural Economics Unit. They send out letters to GPs trying to improve the quality of care, and they'd identified overuse of imaging for musculoskeletal conditions. So we worked with them uh, uh, looking at 11 um, overused investigations. And we convinced them to embed an RCT in their work. And we were able to do a cluster randomised trial uh, and with audit and feedback. So using letters compared, comparing their practice to their peers in the same geographic region. Uh, and over a year, we reduced uh, scans, uh, inappropriate tests by 47,000 scans. Uh, so that's only in one year. And we're just completing a trial um, with them the same, looking at funny pathology tests. We worked with MPS um, in a big program funded by the government called Value in Prescribing of Biologics, where we um, improved care for people with inflammatory arthritis and other diseases that use the biologic drugs. Um, we've just got a big grant, um, Quality Use of Medicines to Improve Care for Gout, um, deprescribe opioids, antidepressants, and and better use of anticoagulants. Uh, and so we we work with implementation scientists. So Denise O'Connor's uh, my deputy head, uh, and she's an expert in that. Uh, and we do hybrid implementation trials where we, as well as measuring the efficacy of something, if it's going to work, we also work out what the barriers and enables are to allow implementation, not waiting seventeen years but immediate impl uh, implementation. Um, our uh, clinical trial network works with consumers and we, we try and have a consumer on every single project. Sometimes they tell us we're asking the wrong question and we change the question. 
So I think the more you can include consumers and policymakers, um, we've also included journalists in our research. Um, so Leah Mannix, who's a, a journalist, the science editor for The Age, uh, is actually one, on one of our papers. So which we're trying a whole different multi, multi-system approach to try and get to policymakers, regulators, um, clinicians, patients, and, and consumers. So. A great talk. Um, I'm James Gray, a, a junior rheumatologist, I suppose. Um, do you have any advice? That's a very long answer. You could answer this in many different ways. But what was your approach and any advice for young rheumatologists and registrars to approach drug companies? Because that is, uh, you know, you need them for research, maybe, uh, there's arguments. Or do you? what's your approach to it and what would be your advice? For so what's my approach issues? now or when I was young? Or both. Or, and what <laughs> would you do if you had your time again? So That's now fun. now um, we have fights in my house because Danny works with drug companies for new trials. And, you know, I think that they've got a really good place and they, you know, they advance, advance medicine. Um, but I personally don't work with them. Um and don't accept funding from them. Um, we do live in guidelines and they've got to be free of um, perceived um, influence. Um, but in the past, so the 3E International Mentorship Program was actually funded by AbbVie. Um, Claire got me into that, my mentor, but she was really clear they didn't have anything to do with what we were doing. They just funded us being able to get together. So I think... You know, you there are good things and there are bad things. But I, you know, when I go to the monthly meeting, I I don't need anything. <laughs> I don't know if that's silly, but yeah, I, I'm very, very. I guess I'm very cautious, and um, uh, yeah. And I have a son who's a rheumatologist, and he's been to ULAR twice, and he knows what I think about it. So, um, so I guess you have to think about it for yourself. Um, there is mounting evidence that we are influenced by industry, even if we don't think we are. We do change our, our prescribing practices. Uh, and uh, I don't. I certainly don't see drug reps uh, at all. Um, and they always trying to see me, leaving me things. I just chuck it in the bin. I don't want to be influenced by them. I've talked, you know, I've done programs where I show ads that drug companies have done and and how they overestimate their benefits and underestimate the harms. So, yeah, I think you have to be very cautious. And, you know, they, they hire people for a reason. They, they have very good marketing skills, I would say. But they're not all bad, but, yeah. Rochelle, um... So, oh, sorry, Ranjani, we can't. I was going to ask you a bad question. question. Yeah. Oh, no, it won't be bad. <laughs> I was interested in, um, you know, overuse of tests and whether you can see that there'll be an integration of genetic risk prediction with reduction in some of the public health screening that we're using, such as frequency of mammograms or whatever it might be, based on genetic risk prediction. Can you see how that might come about and what sort of um, ways in which that that strategy could be implemented? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're in early days of genetic um, testing. Um, I think there are uses in um, detecting like risk, uh, adding to risk. Um, there was an there was um, a talk last week at AHMS about. Do you, were you at that talk where they showed that the genetics actually made a difference about whether you treat now or wait? So I think there are uses. Um, but what I think is for all of these things, and I've got another talk about overuse and how it happens, we really have to make sure that we think about unintended harms and unintended consequences. It's something like a uh, hu huge amount of breast cancer, prostate cancer and melanoma is overdiagnosed in this country. Um, Paul Glazier has published that for men and women, something like 40% um, for breast or for prostate. I think that's the biggest. But over the last decade, uh, overdiagnosed melanoma has increased dramatically. I think it's like 20% of diagnoses or close to that. 
So I think we have to think about the unintended consequences of screening, um, widening disease definitions. We widened um, gestational diabetes for good intentions, um, but now 20% of women are in pregnancy have gestational diabetes with more anxiety, more tests, um, more cesareans and no benefit to patient or mother. Uh, so I think when we do things, we've got to think about unintended harms. And even when we reduce low value care, we've got to make sure that there's no unintended harms of that. So another question online, and I'm going to try and... Um, uh paraphrase it, it's partly because rick you've written in capitals and it's quite hard to read uh, so rick thompson from qut um i wondered on the, I think the tenor of his question is there must be other areas outside rheumatology where this is a real issue in terms of lack of evidence and changing practice um what where have you seen that grow as a result of your work across the country and more broadly, globally, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, other areas? Uh, I mean, we wrote about it in the book. Uh, so it happens at birth. It happens um, futile treatment when you die. Uh, it happens in cardiology. One, things we, one thing we wrote about was stents for stable angina. Um, we had lots of clin specialists ringing us up saying, you didn't talk about what I do that I know is low-value care. I want you to write another book. So I had a gastroenterologist ringing me saying, I don't think anything I do is of value, like nothing. That's like incredible. I had a cardiologist who wanted me to help him um, with the stable angina and stents because the MBS review had recommended uh, change to stop that happening. Uh, and then powerful lobby groups reversed that change. And so it's it's not just rheumatology. Uh, we wrote about it in our book. I mean, certainly screening, um, doing tests for people who aren't really sick, uh, medicalizing normal people, um, birth and death, um, and then lots of surgical procedures. So knee arthroscopy, shoulder surgery, um, a lot of those things have just been uh, happening. Um, someone gets a good idea and then everyone copies and no one's ever evaluated. Um, but there are now increasing numbers of placebo surgical trials um, where, where it's ethical to do so. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's not always ethical. Um, one of my friends, John Kalman, just published a paper on um, ablation um, versus medical therapy for atrial fibrillation. Uh, and they showed a dramatic, um, their primary outcome was anxiety and they showed a dramatic benefit at six months, which increased over time. And he's been criticised because he didn't have a placebo group. And so he asked me about it. And I don't I don't think he needs a placebo group. I think that, that's proof. And, and a placebo trial in that instance might actually be unethical because we already have the answer. Um, yeah. may not happen in oncology. I mean, I think oncology is a very evidence-based, um, except for screening. So uh, we're about to do lung cancer screening for high-risk smokers. Uh, and when you look through the evidence, it's been shown to reduce um, deaths from lung cancer, but it has not been shown to reduce overall mortality. And so even there, we might be doing more harm by detecting cancers that aren't going to kill people. They'll die of something else. So I'm a bit cautious about what's going to happen even with restricted screening. Um, the melanoma overdiagnosis stats are even worse than you were saying. Um, with in, in situ melanomas, it's more than 50%. Um, but my question was, um, have you looked at or do you know people who've looked at um, under treatment in some areas? I'm particularly thinking of under treatment of pain relief, um, especially for women, but um, a lot of people commonly say that they're, you know, ignored when they say they're in pain or they're told, no, what we've given you should be enough. Um, so I think one of the problems with pain is that most of our treatments don't work. Uh, we certainly have a problem with women not being believed. Um, if you look at the, um, I was at the WISER meeting just the last couple of days, they presented data about um, the mesh, the vaginal mesh, and um, someone had qualitatively gone through the 530 submissions and there was a clear theme of women not being believed. 
Um, so I think that's that's one problem. Um, and when lo lots of people are complaining, I mean, I don't know if you know about, I, I listened to a podcast uh, at, where Cambridge, at Cambridge um, in the IVF clinic, um, there was a nurse who was addicted to fentanyl. She was switching fentanyl with um, saline and over a thousand women were saying, I, I can feel what you're doing. I'm in pain. No one believed them for years. So I think <laughs> being a woman, I, I, I think that we have a problem and um, with that as well. So I can't really answer your question. I mean, we know opioids don't work. Um, there's been trials now with a acute pain, chronic pain for back pain I'm talking about. I think opioids have a good place post-surgical. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I'm answering your question. Michelle, um, obviously there are a lot of randomised control trials and we all struggle with ethics and governance. Tell us your journey and how has that helped or hindered the work you're doing? Uh, so I guess the first time ethics really came up was when we wanted to do this invasive placebo treatment. Uh, and around that time, there were really good papers talking about the ethics. When is it ethical to do a placebo trial for a procedure? And so there were a number of questions that you asked. So you can't answer the question in any other way. It's a really important question. Um, do you minimise the harms in the placebo group? And there were a couple of others. So with veroplasty, we um, everyone got everyone got sedation. Um, only the people that got the real treatment got antibiotics. Um, but the placebo group got a cut in their back, got a, 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 a wide bore needle down to bone, and we tapped on the bone because that's what people remember. And we opened the cement and wafted in the air because that's what people remember. We had five ethics committees, and we had to. I think we had to go in person to most of them. The first one I remember was the Royal Melbourne. Uh, and basically they were really supportive. Once we explained why it was important, the, we were worried about harms. We'd done a pilot where we were worried about harms and we explained the safety guards. And the fact that these people are having treatments that might be harmful, um, the placebo really was low risk um, and a lot of surgical things are low risk in the placebo arm they were they were very happy and comfortable and so were all the other um, ethics groups so I guess that's my journey with and we're now we're doing a spinal surgery trial we're um, looking for spinal stenosis where we're randomizing people to placebo surgery where we open up the whole back and um, we just don't do the lamin the widening of the spinal canal um, and we we you know we do um, surveys of patients to see whether they would go into the trial, and they help us with the language and why it's important to do. So consumers really help us with that sort of thing as well. And why it's ethical? Why it's not ethical not to do the trial? It's not ethical to keep doing things if you don't know that the benefits outweigh the harms. So it'd be remiss of me not to ask you about the at-risk threatened species, the clinician scientists. What do you think about the future? Is it positive? Is it negative? And what can we do better? I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I've had very few rheumatologists do a PhD with me. They come from allied health usually or, or epi. Uh, and I think there's just a huge funding hole um, and then once they get their PhD, then there's a problem, even in clinical research. And I know that's happening in basic science. So I think the universities are now offering pay, you know, post-PhD long-term contracts to try and keep them in research. Uh, I think we have to lobby as a group in one voice. Um, it's so incredibly crucial that research is, you know, that improves health. Uh, and I guess that's what we're trying to do with ANS muscle. We're trying to make sure that the basic and applied science people are doing research that will actually improve health, not going down rabbit holes, um, but trying obviously not not to forego innovation and original, uh, you know, discoveries. So I don't I, I don't know the answer. Well, I think um, 
Uh, it's an opportunity now to thank Rochelle. It's been a fantastic uh, hour hearing about your career, about your life, and about uh, your challenges with the media. Um, and uh, I think we take this opportunity to thank Rochelle for coming from Victoria and educating us. We look forward to regrouping in early 2024 with another excellent Game Changer series. Thank you very much for attending today.